Hello, you wonderful people outside. I hope you are fine and healthy and uh, certainly in a bit of a good mood because uh, I felt like I want to make another ranking video. I'm a bit of a geek, so uh, from time to time I have this strange need to create ranking videos. So uh, this time I thought I will direct my attention uh, towards actually one of my favorite bands and that would be the Alan Parsons Project, but you probably already knew that from the thumbnail or uh, the title of the video, anyway. So, uh, why not? Let's do this. Um, not much of uh, ranking rules here, of course, uh, only studio album count, but that's uh, not much of a surprise with this band, because they only made studio albums. and. Um, Probably the only uh, less typical addition to the procedure would be that I intend to count um, the Freudiana album. For me, this there was never a doubt that this is a Alan Parsons Project album, regardless of what's uh, written on the, the sleeve or not. Um, so um, this is a no-brainer for me. Yeah, um, so... Uh, I have a lot of notes here, so um, don't be surprised if I constantly peek into my notes. Um, well, while I do include Freudiana, I certainly will not include Alan Parsons' solo albums. Um, I do recommend them, because they carry over a lot of the project spirit with most of the same uh, musicians and most of the same musical principles. So there are certainly interesting records to, to check out, but if I did that, I would have to probably include Eric Wolfson's solo albums as well, and then it becomes a bit uh, mushy and checkered because uh, a lot of his CDs are basically musicals or soundtrack to musicals, and uh, I'd like to avoid that. So um, let's just stick to the project material. Um, there is one thing I will not talk about during this ranking, and that's uh, the quality of recording, or uh, just the production value in general. Because in this case it's completely given, I mean, it's like talking about Adam Ondra being a great climber. Yeah, everybody knows that. Um, so, um, Alan Parsons, uh, one of the great ears and one of the great engineers of uh, pop and rock history, so... There is just not a single Alan Parsons Project album that is in any way flawed in the sound department. So uh, that's just given and I don't need to repeat that uh, with every album I talk about. Yeah, so um, I don't want to make too much of a prologue, but it's a kind of interesting topic because uh, it's a very unique band in a way, particularly because, uh, uh, well, maybe for two two reasons. One reason why I think this is a very interesting band is, uh, first of all, they created, at least in my book, they created seven consecutive masterpieces of albums. After that seven albums, you can kind of identify certain traces of decline, but um, there are actually not that many bands you can uh, consider here that have created some, something similar. I mean, seven seven albums in a row that are just outstanding, all seven of them. Well, at least in my book, but it's my video, so of course you will constantly get my strongly subjective uh, perspective on this. So even, a, see, even an epic giant band like Pink Floyd could never claim that. Uh, just seven, seven LPs in a row that are just outstanding and um, more or less almost flawless, I would say. Um, so that's certainly something that makes this band quite interesting and fascinating. But the other thing that is so unique about the Alan Parsons project is the fact that they, unlike other bands, uh, they really embraced a formulaic production principles or formulaic ways of creating albums. And um, it's almost, you could almost create a checklist and just see which albums of theirs kind of. Uh, check every um, attribute of this checklist, of this formula. So um, how does a Alan Parsons Project album formula look like? 
First of all, you have to start with a short but very enigmatic instrumental piece. This piece certainly leads into the second song, which must be immediately like the first climax of the album. So the second song must just deliver, uh, deliver it home completely. Third aspect of the formula is to change singers all the time. You look at the song, at the composition, and then you pick just the best voice you can get for this type of music. Um, for um, it can hurt if the album has a kind of a soft concept, but it should never be a too obtrusive concept that uh, demands too much of your attention. So it's more like a general conceptual framework that can also be ignored, if you like. Five, um, particularly on the B-side, there must be a amazing instrumental uh, created by Alan Parsons. It must be groovy and it must be extremely mysterious at the same time. Um, six, always bring in Andrew Powell and the orchestra. Seven, let Hypnosis make the cover design. Eight, the last track should be a heartbreaking ballad. Nine, as I said, the sound of the album must be flawless. And ten, don't be afraid to assimilate entire bands into your own project. So this was kind of be the 10 point uh, Alan Parsons project formula. And uh, not every album uh, checks all 10 boxes here, but uh, some of them, more or less, almost all of them. So uh, that's certainly a, a kind of unique and um, Probably for some people this is like an off-putting aspect of the band because uh, it doesn't sound very uh, spontaneous. Um, and yeah, I understand that um, one can feel that way, that the Alan Parsons Project is a bit of a genetically engineered band. Uh, those are not a bunch of guys that grew up uh, in the same street together and had uh, fistfights uh, with some schoolyard bullies. This is not the type of band uh, of uh, some intellectual peers that went to the art school together or something like that. It's an extremely uh, kind of artificial created construct uh, where, um, I mean, the lore, and I don't, I don't know, I don't know if this is exactly true, but the lore says that um, Eric Wolfson and Alan Parsons met for the first time probably in the late 1975, maybe early 76, I'm not very sure about that. And they had a lunch together and during that lunch, Alan Parsons complained a little bit to Wolfson that uh, sometimes it's it costs so much energy for him as a sound engineer and producer just uh, to convince musicians sometimes to do the right thing and just to overcome their stubbornness and uh, their attitude. Um, to achieve a better result and wouldn't it be great if there would be a band that is not run by musicians but by the producers. Now on paper this doesn't sound very appealing because uh, usually uh, we associate the uh, producers, well not, not, not usually and not always, but sometimes we kind of associate producers with uh, the other side of the table where the suits are sitting and um, there are just too many stories from the world of rock and pop where the producer is kind of the interfering uh, obnoxious uh, character that just doesn't get it and that is thinks in far too commercial uh, terms and etc. So um, it's kind of a... Alan Parsons project is a bit counterintuitive in that way but um, the point is, uh, in this one case, it just works beautifully and what you get is just this uh, outstanding, uh, sonically highly unique uh, pop and rock band uh, with certain leanings towards art rock and prog rock. And I'm fully aware that in those days when uh, Alan Parsons Project still existed and was popular and sold records like crazy, that this was a project that was kind of perceived as a little little too bourgeois, probably. 
this was kind of the middle class, the band for the middle class, you know, for the guy for, for, who works in at the in the office and makes enough money to afford a really good stereo set. And in the seventies, you always been looking for those type of albums and records that were appropriate for the quality of your of your hi-fi tower in your living room. So uh, Alan Parsons' project obviously uh, was a uh, the right band uh, for people with uh, high fidelity tendencies. And uh, um, so I kind of get that, uh, particularly in my generation, uh, the guys I used to hang out with um, that were punks or kind of indie type of people, for them this was not uh, the type of uh, music they would uh, spend any time with. So there, there was a certain feeling of uh, of Alan Parsons' project being like this safe band for the middle class and uh, kind of uh, adventurous only in its own kind of fantastic projection, uh, but uh, actually very, very square behind the curtains. So this was a large, giant uh, prologue now <laughs> for a ranking video. So um, I'm sorry about that. Oh, one more thing before we start. So it's quite obvious that if I don't mention it, then someone will someone will mention it in the comments, and uh, then it will be like, "Yes, but you did not include the Sicilian defense." Yeah, in a sense, I did not, or I could include the Sicilian defense. But if I would include the Sicilian defense, it would end up on the last place basically on on uh, the 12th place. Um, but let's not forget that Sicilian Defense is not really an album. This is more like a joke. And uh, I guess if you are an Alan Parsons Project diehard fan, then you know all about it. If you're not, you may find this somewhat interesting. So this is music recorded, I think, in 1979. And it was a bit of a ploy by Wolfson and Parsons to shortcut their contract with Arista Records and they still owed them an album so uh, they went to the to the studio for one weekend just set up a few synthesizers and created like 40 minutes of a uh, little bit piano playing a little bit uh, kind of pointless uh, synthesizer musings and ramblings and uh, almost almost like some type of atmospheric uh, elevator music uh, album and uh, knowing that uh, this was by light years unacceptable as a as an Alan Parsons project album they delivered this to Arista um, and so Arista was forced to refuse the presented results but at the same time to accept that uh, they had delivered uh, uh, five records to them um, so um, immediately uh, the negotiations for an entirely new contract uh, could have started, uh, which then of course led to the production of uh, A Turn of a Friendly Cart, which was an extremely successful album. So this was not an outrageous wrong move uh, on Parsons and Wilson's part, because uh, this actually turned out exactly as they probably thought it would. Um, and I kind of get it, because I believe when this band started uh, with their first album, uh, no one actually expected too much of a success out of it. So th the contract probably reflected that, particularly because this band or these two guys from the beginning said there will be no tours, there will be no concerts at all. This is a pure studio project. So. For, for Arista, it was probably already clear that this will not be commercially f too interesting because if the if the band is just not supporting the album with the tour, then it's kind of tough. Or at least this is how it was uh, back in the day. Uh, it's actually more extreme today in that department. Um, but uh, to maybe to some people's surprise, these records sold like crazy and really put them on the map. So uh, they were able to sustain themselves as a band successfully without any kind of concerts, even without showing their faces too much uh, in some magazines. So um, I can imagine that four albums later they felt like, yeah, our contract really doesn't reflect our success. Uh, so uh, what can we do about it?
So that's kind of all you can say about the Sicilian Defense. Again, it's not really an album, it's just a bunch of demo-ish tracks. And uh, like, I listened to it maybe once in five years. Um, it can be kind of an interesting uh, sound in the background. So let's get to the real meat now. On position number 11 is the 1984's album Volcha Culture. It's hard to believe that this was supposed to be part of uh, a Ammonia Avenue double LP. This would have been the entire second disc. I really can't wrap my mind around that. Uh, particularly because Ammonia Avenue is a fascinating, great album, and the last one of these so-called, what I call like the seven flawless consecutive records, and uh, this material would have so much diluted Ammonia Avenue that I'm really glad they uh, didn't do that and uh, released this like two or three years later as an album of its own. Um, it's the only album they uh, produced in those years without Andrew Powell, which is probably a mistake. This album begins with a track called Let's Talk About Me, sang by David Payton, and uh, this is actually a very good song and uh, certainly one of the better moments of this record. Um, then uh, follows a whole string of songs um, written by Eric Wolfson that are all kept in this strange kind of uh, European, uh, kind of sh like a German Schlager type of music of the 70s or 80s, so um, quite awful. It's, it's, it's like something written for Roger Whittaker. You know, the tracks Separate Lives, uh, Days Are Numbers, beautifully sang by Chris Rainbow. Anyway, um, sooner or later, probably the worst song on the entire album. It's all like music for uh, bumper car parks. Now, uh, the B-side begins with the title track, Volcha Culture, sang by Lenny Zakatek. Now, this is by far one of the best tracks here. This number is really outstanding. And yeah, Volcha Culture would have been a great song on Ammonia Avenue. I give you that. Um, it's followed by a decent instrumental called Hawkeye with uh, Richard Cottle on sax. It's, 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 this is an okay track. I find uh, I don't find it as strong as Alan Parsons' uh, usual B-side instrumentals uh, on the previous albums. We'll get to them. Then there's a track, Somebody Out There, with uh, Colin Blundstone of The Zombies on vocals. Quite decent, so it's it's a it's a good uh, it's a good song, uh, but it already shows uh, that Eric Wolfson's uh, musical tendencies were already forming, uh, and uh, that uh, this would be something that uh, he would spend uh, the remaining years of his life uh, doing, writing uh, kind of stage play musical music. Uh, yeah, and the album ends with a track called The Same Old Sun, which uh, I can only ex ex describe as horrendous. Um, just for your interest, uh, there was a like remixed uh, version of uh, Walter Culture uh, that came out on a 12-inch. Uh, yeah, and uh, that's that. Um, number 10 is uh, the 1987's album Gaudi. Now this was like, this has been regarded as the last proper Alan Parsons project album because uh, after that uh, they only released uh, the Freudiana album. Now I can't say I was purely disappointed by this effort, but the record kind of leaves you a little bit empty, albeit not entirely. Overall, it is a pure 80s pop album with a lot of kind of schlock, schlock material and uh, with a rather inspired uh, opening track. Uh, so this opening track is called La Sagrada Familia and as a piece of music it's uh, far from any type of uh, pop or rock cliché. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a very original and kind of unique composition with John Miles Eric Wolfson and Chris Rainbow on vocals. It's followed by a track called Too Late, uh, sang by Lenny Zakatek. Um, yeah, that's that's a kind of decent 80s pop schlock track. 
uh, Closer to Heaven uh, is sang by Eric Wolfson and it's one of those that uh, I find rather boring and it's a bit of a low point on this record at least for me I mean the the whole track feels kind of demo-ish and it's far too long but there is a nice uh, sax solo by Richard Cottle which is quite good um, then it's followed by Standing on Higher Ground uh, with uh, Jeff Baradale from Vitamin Z uh, on vocals uh, this is like an ultra 80s production but in a rather positive way I think this is one of the better songs on the album. Uh, followed by Money Talks, sang by John Miles. Um, sounds, sounds a bit like, uh, like Robert Palmer, if you ask me. Uh, which was most certainly a secret inspiration for this, for this song. Inside Looking Out, uh, I really see no reason why this song is 6 minutes 20 long. Um, and this sounds so much, so much like some, something that belongs in one of Eric Wolfson's musicals. And I'm pretty sure this is where his head was at that point in time. I mean, it's a good song if you like musicals. It certainly has this nice playfulness, and um, which is the main feature, by the way, of this entire album. And uh, the last minutes of the song are really lovely. Um, and this blends into the final track, which is called uh, Paseo de Gracia, uh, an instrumental. The expected Alan Parsons instrumental, once again with a rather cinematic Andrew Powell orchestration, reflecting the tunes of the opening track and nicely closing the album. It's actually one of the highlights here, to be honest. So uh, I, I find Gaudi is a rather good record uh, with uh, some strong high points and some uh, less interesting tracks to put it mildly uh, let's continue number nine is uh, the album that i cannot show you here because i have it only on cd and i could not find the cd um, i'm talking about the 1990s production freudiana so this is one of those odd albums where people basically fight over nothing for all kind of reasons this has this had the moniker the Alan Parsons project removed at the very last moment and it certainly marks the definite end of the project. This whole double album was intended as a soundtrack record to Eric Wolfson's musical of the same name. Um, but uh, the entire lineup is exactly as Alan Parsons project was at this point in time. Um, it's the second album after Gaudi without David Payton on bass, though, uh, and vocals. Um, now, as far as I remember, David Payton was snatched away by Elton John and played on his album and uh, also uh, most certainly went on tour with him in those years, and which didn't go down well with Parsons. But uh, that problem sooner or later was to be expected since the Alan Parsons project really didn't give their band members that much work since they didn't tour. So uh, they might have been working for a month or two every year to create a new album. But uh, the other 10 months uh, as, an, as a member of this band you were, you were basically on your own. Which is one of the reasons why in those years the lineup of the Alan Parsons project keeps appearing on all kind of interesting albums. I mean, almost all of them played on the first uh, of the debut album by Kate Bush. And there are some other examples. So, um, Freudiana has a wonderful opening uh, with this instrumental, The Nirvana Principle, which is leading into the title track Freudiana, almost reigniting the magic of Sirius and Eye in the Sky. It's followed by a track called I Am A Mirror, which is very kind of musical-like, unsurprisingly, with Leo Sayer on vocals. Um, it's an okay track. Little Hands, let's call it an homage to the Beatles, so we don't need to call it a Beatles rip-off. <laughs> it sounds like they're channeling Lennon McCartney on this song. Dora is another example of Wolfson's newfound kind of Schlager identity, but it's actually kind of okay. Um, I don't have that much of a problem with the song. Funny you should say that is a typical musical uh, composition uh, by Wolfson, very whimsical. And if you forget that this belongs into a musical, actually it is almost surprising and like something you could expect on a Frank Zappa album. 
because it comes with this kind of quirky attitude. The other redeeming quality of the song is the fact that all the vocals are covered by the flying pickets. Uh, next track is uh, You Are On Your Own with uh, vocals by Kiki D, which is a decent rock song. Far Away From Home, uh, again sung by the Flying Pickets, uh, is a nice ballad and a bit of a callback to the glorious days of the past. Um, also very twee, the song, but on a high level though. Actually, it sounds like something that Benny Anderson would have written. Uh, Let Yourself Go, sang by Eric Wolfson himself, is a great song and actually one of the big highlights on this record, I think. Uh, it's followed by Beyond the Pleasure Principle, which is the typical Alan Parsons uh, Home Alone uh, instrumental. Um, here with a lot of uh, orchestral attention by Andrew Powell and some sleeky synth parts by Richard Cottle. Um, it does not have this intriguing, alluring beat as Alan Parsons' instrumentals usually have. But on the other hand, he had already done this so many times, so I um, can understand that here he tried to push the envelope and create a little bit of a different dynamic. Uh, the Ring and Upper Me are both sung by Eric Stewart of 10cc. Now, those are both actually quite good songs. Sects Therapy um, is a song sang by Frankie Howard. Um, and yeah, this is kind of a pure musical stage show uh, performance, so not exactly my cup of tea, and that's all I can say about it. Um, and exactly the same goes for No One Can Love You Better Than Me, with lead vocals by Kiki D and Marty Webb and Gary Howard and Eric Wolfson himself. Uh, if you... now you have to be a fan of uh, musicals to like this. Um, there is no two ways around it. But in all honesty, this is actually quite beautifully written, arranged and recorded. So I may dislike musicals, but I can still appreciate the quality and uh, the just the level of work here. For me, it makes it one of the highlights of this record, actually. Just on its own, this can keep up with the best days of the Alan Parsons project. So uh, it's not a bad track at all. Don't Let the Moment Pass... Uh, sang by Marty Webb uh, is a pure musical schlock. Again, it has this kind of a Benny Anderson vibe. Freudiana instrumental, this is a fine little detour where Andrew Powell and Alan Parsons are having a bit fun with orchestra and uh, uh, all the recording equipment. It is an instrumental variation on the t title track and it sounds really great. The funny thing is if you have Andrew Powell on board for the orchestral arrangements and for the orchestral composition, you make other bands using orchestras look like chumps. <laughs> I don't know how else to say that. So this is a very solid uh, Alan Parsons project stuff here. Certainly very reminiscent of Andrew Powell's uh, Ladyhawk soundtrack, which is basically this secret Alan Parsons project album. I've almost included it in this ranking, but then I thought it's a bit too cheeky. So anyway, good stuff. Um, so the final part of Freudiana is marked by two connected tracks called Destiny and There But For The Grace Of God. And uh, again, this is already arranged and recorded like a musical sung by John Miles and Marty Webb. It's well written and quite profits uh, from Andrew Powell's always reliable orchestral arrangements. I mean, the first half of this album, Freudiana, can still somewhat be perceived like a pop album. But the second half has really this strong uh, stage show uh, appearance to it. Obviously, it is a musical soundtrack. So this entire album is a source of some good songs for me, particularly the first two tracks and Let Yourself Go. But as an album experience... It's a bit tough because there are just too many tracks here that I don't like to hear that much. So, moving on. Number 8. 1985's Stereo Tommy. In hindsight, it is very surprising that uh, Stereo Tommy was less successful than Vulture Culture, despite being only two years apart. These records are very different from each other and very different in sound and style. It is unfortunately one of those albums that has no Lenny Zakatek on it, on vocals, which shows a little. It is also the last appearance of David Payton on bass. Personally, I think it is an album where 
Stuart Elliot is awfully underused in a rather typical 80s fashion. Actually, sometimes it sounds like he's playing only the snare drum all the time. So this is certainly not an album that would be very inspirational to drummers. It begins with uh, the title track Stereotomy, beautifully sang by John Miles and uh, with additional vocals by Eric Wolfson. This title track is quite brilliant. Sonically a masterpiece, it has great energy and intensity. There is also this sudden intermezzo where Eric Wolfson is singing and um, this is a great opener to an album. The song is a little mysterious and edgy and aggressive at the same time. Uh, Ian Berenson's guitar sound is outstanding as always and some really capable keyboard playing by Richard Cottle. It's followed by a track called Beaujolais, sang by Chris Rainbow. Now this is probably my least favorite track on this album, but honestly it's not a bad song. It just has this Eurodance vibe that I don't like that much, but I mean it has Chris Rainbow on vocals, which is always a win. And I mean, this guy can sing. It is certainly one of those songs that can get stuck in your head because it's very, very catchy. Followed by Urbania. Of course, no project album without some tasty instrumentals by Alan Parsons. This one certainly pushes the envelope a little bit. A fascinating, slightly nervous track. And then the A-side closes with a track called Limelight, which is um, probably their most popular track of the later years, of the later era. It's beautifully sang by Gary Brooker of Procol Harum. And uh, personally, the song never really grew on me, but on an intellectual level I can hear how beautifully written it is and how beautifully uh, Gary Brooker is singing here. Although I would say that the drum sound here certainly didn't age that well. The B-side begins with a track called In the Real World, uh, sang by John Miles. It's obviously the rocker of this album, kind of trying to reignite the B-side opening of I'm the Sky with uh, You're Gonna Get Your Fingers Burned. This would be a great song if this was a flash dance soundtrack. <laughs> it's followed by Where's the Walrus, uh, another Alan instrumental. Now, first of all, what an amazing bass playing by David Payton and keyboard playing by Richard Cottle here. Just excellent. The whole track sounds like the soundtrack to some 80s action movie or like something out of Bloodsport. It's hilarious. You have to hear this for yourself. One of the highlights on this album, for sure. Also, uh, Richard Cottle plays uh, really a hot saxophone here uh, and some really lovely intense improvisation by Ian Branson on guitar. This track actually won the band a Grammy, not that this means anything to me, but it certainly means something to them. But the overall sound is just outstanding and again David Payton's bass sounds beautiful here. Now one could probably have a debate on whether this track needs to be seven and a half minutes long, but over time I've learned to like the length. Now this song fades over into uh, Light of the World with uh, Graham Dye and Stephen Dye on vocals. It's a decent song and a really nice arrangement. Uh, it is also another example how much Wolfson and Parsons were actually influenced by the Beatles. Um, then you have a very short instrumental track, only one minute long, called Chinese Whispers. Unfortunately only one minute because this is certainly one of my favorite moments on the album and I really enjoy this short minute. Uh, and then uh, you have uh, kind of like an epilogue, another one and a half minutes of Stereotomy Part 2. Uh, again sung by John Miles and this is just kind of a 90 seconds reprisal of the main theme. But here it actually works pretty well. Overall this is a decent album that sounds quite different than all the previous one. Probably because it is the first one that they recorded completely digitally which certainly informed the choice of the synthesizers and the sound of the drums a lot. So this album actually has its fans. I see people occasionally naming it their favorite Alan Parsons project album. Well, I don't need to understand everything in this world. I certainly like the title track, I like Chinese Whispers and I very much like Where's the Walrus. So this also concludes all the later years albums. Uh, which were not bad by any measure, 
but that only shows how outstanding and mind-blowing the first seven albums of this band were. So let's continue in the order of ranking. But from now on, every record is just outstanding and quite a masterpiece. And at least in my book, rather flawless. So let's begin. Number seven is the before mentioned 1983 Ammonia Avenue. This is a great emotive album with a cool sound that is modern and yet doesn't at all succumb to any 80s production malarkey. And it was their seventh album and they were still in a great shape, in a great form here. Um, you have this kind of a vocal power unit here of Lenny Zakatek, Colin Blumstone and Chris Rainbow. They're three strongest singers. You have Mel Collins on saxophone here. Uh, of course, you have kind of the core, the core lineup of Ian Bernson on guitar, David Payton on bass and Stuart Elliott uh, on drums. Uh, and of course, you have Andrew Powell doing orchestration and conducting and um, Eric Wolfson playing all the keyboards and synth. And of course, Alan Parsons uh, engineering and programming the Fairlight. Now, this album begins uh, with the wonderful track Primetime, sang by Eric Wolfson himself, which is a bit of a departure from the main formula because uh, usually those records start with a, at least in a golden era, had a tendency to start with a short instrumental. But this is a great heavy duty opener. Um, it also makes me think of uh, the Life in Madrid um, DVD by Alan Parsons, uh, where this was uh, sang by uh, Godfrey Townsend, uh, the guitar player uh, of, of, of that particular lineup, and quite beautifully, quite beautifully. So um, it's followed by the track Let Me Go Home, sang by Lenny Zakatek. This is another great banger with Lenny on vocals. A perfect song for his voice, by the way, very playful and beautifully enraged. Lenny has a really kind of commanding presence here. And overall a great complex production with all kind of interesting keyboard and bass parts going on in the background. Uh, followed by One Good Reason, sang by Eric Wolfson, uh, with this kind of a hypnotic uh, demeanor that was quite characteristic in those years. Great rhythm pattern with uh, this hand clap and those tom-toms spread over the stereo. Great song. And uh, then uh, it's followed by um, Since the Last Goodbye. And now, it's no secret, I'm not too much into ballads, but when Chris Rainbow is singing, you are paying attention. And this is certainly a strong composition that has this um, subliminal, mysterious vibe, almost like you are trapped in some gothic novel or some dark romantic story. And then the song concludes in this quiet type of harmony, singing on a rather positive note. I mean, it's all a little bit of kitsch, but in a really good way. Now, talking about kitsch, uh, the next track is Don't Answer Me. What can I say? I mean, for me, this song really always stuck out like a sore thump out of this album because of its simplicity and you know it's the one song for concerts where everybody gets the lighters out and ugh. but then again to create something catchy and simple like that and yet so beautifully functioning overall by the standards of uh, of a kind of pop chart track this is an excellent song i mean when i was a kid i loved the song now I gave it another listen after many years, skipping it a little. And you know what? It's great. And I'm pretty sure Don't Answer Me paid for the rest of the album, since it was a bit of a hit when it came out. Now the B-side begins with Dancing on a High Wire, sang by Colin Blunstone, who is one of the great British singers. And this is pure project material. Outstanding track, checking all the boxes. It's just such a lovely inventive pop song and uh, with a wonderful kind of careful guitar solo by Ian Bernson. It's followed by You Don't Believe, um, again sang by Lenny Zakatek, one of the highlights of this album I would say. It was a bit like a track that could have looked really good on the Eve album. Great song with this hypnotic energy and uh, with a bit of a subliminal dance floor feel, um, followed by Pipeline. 
which is one of the great Alan Parsons instrumentals, very typically placed as the second last track on the album. Outstanding bass by David Payton and damn, these orchestral passages by Andrew Powell are just epic here. And then in the middle of the song, Mel Collins starts to play saxophone. Wow, this is just incredible. Even now, seven albums in, in 1984, they could still produce a track that flawlessly captures the essence of the band. I can't exactly imagine how someone could dislike a track like Pipeline. And uh, this then uh, is followed by the title track Ammonia Avenue, which is the longest track here. And it's starting with uh, some beautiful piano playing by Eric Wilson and an acoustic guitar uh, played by uh, Ian Bernson. It certainly feels like Silence and I part two. And it's probably something they tried to kind of reignite uh, again, but it's also just a great composition nonetheless. This too has this outrageous, playful middle part with a lot of instrumental action going on. And obviously it's tracks like that uh, that added the Alan Parsons project to the eternal, never-ending discussion of is it prog or not? <laughs> the production here is just wow. So finally, a word about the album cover. Of course, it has all the mannerisms of hypnosis, uh, and it's actually a Storm Thorgerson concept, kind of one of the first designs after the breakup of hypnosis, although people have usually the tendency to call this a hypnosis cover as well, and it's not entirely wrong. So overall, this is an amazing album, and yet I think it's my least favorite of those before mentioned seven, which only tells you how amazing I find the following. So let's continue. Number six is the 1978's Pyramid. Great record. This was their third album and certainly not an easy task to follow the predecessor. Great lineup here with Eric Wolfson and Duncan McKay on keyboards. Of course, you have the three pilots here, Peyton, Elliot and Bernson on a bass, drums and guitar. The album begins with the instrumental and very enigmatic track Voyager, followed by the sophisticated song called What Goes Up, sang by the bass player David Payton, who has an excellent voice, by the way. Great song with a very unique, unusual feel to it, which makes it very memorable. Then it's followed by a wonderful orchestral ballad called The Eagle Will Rise Again with Colin Blundstone on vocals. It has this slightly gothic or medieval mood to it, uh, something the band would explore much more on Turn of a Friendly Card. As far as slow songs go, this is one of my favorite actually. In contrast, the refrain has this symphonic feel to it. It's all very kind of large canvas. It's followed by One More River. Now, uh, One More River is being sung by the wonderful Lenny Zakatek, in my book, one of the greatest rock singers in existence. So this is an energetic uh, vocal performance that is also kind of very idiosyncratic. You have to listen to it for yourself because Lenny has this quite uh, unique way of singing. And then you get a great saxophone solo by Phil Kenzie, um, whom Alan Parsons, of course, knew because he had engineered and produced a Year of the Cat by Al Stewart, uh, where Phil Kenzie plays saxophone on, which, uh, as far as the lore goes, uh, was a bit of a surprising proposition by Parsons to Al Stewart, who at this point was not that interested to kind of jazz up his uh, folk rock album. <laughs> but uh, once again, um, when Alan Parsons uh, had an idea in those days, it was usually a good one and uh, probably the right one. So um, this leads uh, to the last track on uh, the A-side, which is Can't Take It With You. Another big highlight here, um, sung by Dean Ford, who back in the day was the lead singer of uh, the band The Marmalades. So if you remember Reflections of My Life, this is Dean Ford. So this is a great vocal. Um, and some additional vocals here are provided by Colin Blundstone. Can't Take It With You is 
upbeat and energetic and but but like many of uh, the classic project songs it has this slightly darker feel to it a sense of urgency and drama switching between uh, the rather fast main tempo and the half tempo in the refrain overall this is a great song so the b-side starts with the instrumental in the lab of the gods which fulfills your expectations of a typical Alan Parsons space-time continuum track and then some more. It starts with this rather enigmatic uh, flute sound, uh, almost like something from a Eastern hero movie, but then this whole thing constantly graduates and tumefies with all these voices. So technically it is not a instrumental per se, because there are these, all these choir elements there. And finally the composition turns into this orchestral charge with a huge choir being the English chorale, by the way. This is some great cinematic stuff. I can't believe all music gave this album like three stars. Get the hell out of here. Is it pompous as fuck? Yeah. Is it pretentious? Yeah. Sue me. <laughs> so, great song. Uh, extremely self-indulgent and quite wonderful. Now this is followed by Pyromania. Now, Pyramania foreshadows a style of music that would much later come more and more into focus uh, when Wolfson started to do his musical thing. This is certainly a hint of Beatlemania and a touch of Phil Spector and ABBA in the song, but at the same time it is intentionally a bit of a goofy song because it makes fun of esoteric people and their crazy unscientific beliefs which is a bit of a soft concept for this entire album. So it is a very short track, uh, but uh, one of the rare moments uh, when uh, the Alan Parsons project kind of shows a more a humorous side to them. Uh, it's immediately followed by Hyper Gamma Spaces, a typical Alan Parsons uh, instrumental. Now this track is killing it. Of course it is the second last track on the album, We've been talking about the formulaic nature of it all. Now this is 1978 and I'm not sure if Alan was aware how much he was ahead of the curve with this one. Outstanding, envelope pushing, proto dance floor piece of electronica music and a total stoner sound from space. And finally, uh, and yeah that's not for the last time, this album ends on a somewhat corny yet unsurprisingly beautiful slow song called Shadow of a Lonely Man, sang by John Miles with Colin Blundstone in the background. So unsurprisingly the cover is by Hypnosis. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite of their covers, despite it being such a simple concept. You see Alan Parsons here in this rather less than luxurious hotel room, face palming his eyes, uh, wearing pajamas. But there is of course this slightly mysterious feeling of science fiction and suspense in the air. There is a touch of twilight zone in the room. It is there, yet it can't be explained that easily. But your eyes be begin to wander through the entire album design, discovering all these objects. Not only the objects you can see in the, in the hotel room, but all kind of different odd stuff. Of course as a kid I had it all analyzed and could basically contextualize every object in the design here. Even the razor blades. Do you want to know the meaning of the razor blades? So a few years prior to that album here, there was a guy, coincidentally a countryman of mine, who had registered a patent for little pyramid models that could sharpen your razor blades, so you would not need to buy a new one. He claimed to have discovered that if you place a dull or blunt razor blade inside a pyramid, it will turn sharp after a few days. So yeah, this was the right album cover to geek out really hard. <laughs> also the pyramid logo here on the label. Number 5. The 1976 debut album Tales of Mystery and Imagination, Edgar Allan Poe. Now, some people may begrudge me for not 
placing the debut album much higher. I guess most people have it around place three, two, uh, or often place number one. And I totally get it, because Tales of Mystery and Imagination from 1976 is a wonderful, highly unique album. What a start! I certainly do think that this is one of the strongest debut records of all times. I mean, not many bands could ever be that strong right out of the barn. But of course, this was possible because this band was basically a secret supergroup appropriating left and right very experienced artists that already had success with other projects. So for Alan Parsons, this was never about what should we do, but always about which one of the hundred singers I've already worked with is the best for exactly this type of song. So of course, with this approach, uh, you can uh, create a quite an exciting debut album. Now I will tell one thing about this record, which I find quite um, important. Um, bands that were kind of artistic and progressive uh, in the late 60s and throughout the 70s, many of them kind of walked into the trap of working with an orchestra. And I, th I feel like in most of the cases, um, often it's, it's not a disaster, but uh, sometimes it just doesn't add that much to the music or it's not, it doesn't sound or feel that important. And um, it's certainly not a very captivating element of the band in question. For me, this goes for Deep Purple as much as it goes for Pink Floyd and Atom Heart Mother or, or uh, all the orchestral escapades of uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, etc. Um, or Time of the Word by Yes and so on. I think this is one of the examples of the complete opposite. This is one of the greatest representations of a pop or rock band working with an orchestra. It's really, really outstanding. Um, I mean, the other case where I would think that this works rather good is uh, probably Salisbury by Uriah Heep, by the way. But that's a different story. So um, there is a lot of orchestra stuff here and it's all amazing. And um, there is a particular reason for that and I will get to it. This is also the one album where the entire band pilot is completely assimilated, including Stuart Tosh on drums and Billy Lyle on keyboards. The album is a rather strict concept, concept album, and with the exception of Freudiana, probably the only concept album they ever made where the attention to the concept was very emphatic. There were other concept albums by the Alan Parsons Project, but always in a very loose and inobtrusive manner. But this album here was entirely dedicated to Edgar Allan Poe and his novels, poems and stories. And yes, part of me thinks it should rank higher on my list, particularly because of the B-side. So this album starts with A Dream Within a Dream, which is more or less an instrumental. And uh, here for the first time it's it blends uh, into one of the main songs. Um, it's a tactic reused uh, on at least four or five other albums. Um, and the next song is uh, The Raven, sang by Leonard Whitting, and with a bit of uh, kind of electronic vocoder singing by Alan Parsons. The Raven is one of the great classic songs of the Alan Parsons project and quite extraordinary. An exciting guitar solo by Ian Benson. Leonard Whitting was actually an actor and probably not many knew how good a singer he was, uh, but uh, Typical for Alan Parsons just to know those things. Um, it's followed by this. Uh, the track is followed by the tale, the Telltale Heart. Um, Arthur Brown is singing this rather eccentric track. Back in the day, I didn't like this song that much. It felt like something from Phantom of the Opera. But over time, the song kind of grew on me. It is certainly a telltale sign that, uh, no pun intended, that Wolfson would become a stage play composer one day. You can already hear it here. Now, there is this beautiful calm middle part with Eric Wolfson on vocals, more in the background, just adding this kind of vocal texture. This part is really cool and then this ambient section comes in and for half a minute or so, and then Ian Berenson's guitar crystallizes. It's all very wonderful. The next track is The Cask of Amontillado. Um, John Miles sings this song. It's a very dramatic composition and beautifully supported by Terry Sylvester, almost like a duet. 
there's a great drama in this song with a touch of the 60s and the eruption of Andrew Powell with his orchestra. Great song, very ethereal. Now, up until now, this album is amazing, but that's not even the best stuff. The last track on the A-side is The System of Dr. Tar and Professor Feather. Vocals performed by John Miles. Now, this is stuff of legends. It's an amazing uh, hypnotic uh, rhythmic composition. Um, and again, one of the classic tracks uh, of this band. Um, the B-side by the way, contains only two main compositions, first of them being the 16-minute long extravaganza, The Fall of the House of Usher. In my book, still one of the three best orchestral works done by a rock or pop band. Of course, this entire section is Andrew Powell's doing, and uh, that's the explanation uh, why this stuff is so good. Andrew Powell is a highly trained musician who studied music under luminaries like Georgi Ligeti and Karl-Heinz Stockhausen. So artistically this is one of the great pinnacles uh, of this band's history. And it's no surprising that this is one of the rare cases when uh, um, Andrew Powell his photo is included in the liner notes, kind of like a third member of this band whose uh, creators are usually regarded as this duo of Parsons and Wolfson. But um, here it's more like a brainchild of three people and uh, certainly this album shows it a lot on the B-side. Um, the last track is uh, The One in Paradise and uh, it is kind of a slow closer with Terry Sylvester on vocals with some really sweet background vocals by Wolfson and Parsons. It is a beautiful ballad with a certain psychedelic feel to it. Hard to explain. The sound of the song is very liquid, almost muddy, but in a really wonderful way. The recording of this track feels actually quite intimate despite this being a rather bombastic band. And then a beautiful, beautiful fade out and this highly unique experience is over. I mean, if you don't know this album, you really need to do your homework. So um, this was a Hypnosis cover. It certainly has some interesting kind of optical visual elements uh, inside. Um, and it's certainly a little more intricate than the other covers uh, they did. Uh, for the band. But la in later years um, this was reissued in a much more simpler configuration without um, without uh, the gatefold sleeve. Anyway, <coughs> number four is the 1980s The Turn of a Friendly Card. Now this is often many people's favorite project album particularly if the reviewer is mostly into prog rock. So it has the reputation to be their progiest album. But ironically, I find it also very much influenced by disco and the British jazz funk to some extent. This album is a concept album about gambling and the world of casinos. Now this album here does not start with a typical short Allen instrumental, but with the iconic Maybe a Price to Pay sang by Elma Gantry. Now this is an amazing opener with these dramatic, urgent brass accents uh, like something out of a movie. And that's just the beginning, but that's attention grabbing of the highest order. Followed by Games People Play, maybe one of the greatest songs done by the Alan Parsons Project, sang by, well, none other than Lenny Zakatek. This is one of the best pop songs I know. It is immaculate. A genius masterpiece. Oh, I love using these superlative terms. <laughs> Words cannot really describe the quality of the material here. Lenny's voice and performance is just otherworldly. I don't know if you noticed, but I really like this song. <laughs> and then you get this haunting ambient middle part that explodes into this amazing Ian Berenson guitar solo. One of my favorite solos of all times. This stuff is directly from the Olymp. Yeah, and after this very energetic two openers, of course, a ballad follows. Now, Time is a song very much revered by Project fans. I must confess, I was never really that much into the, into the song. 
maybe because I'm a cynical, cold-hearted son of a bitch. Although I don't think I'm a psychopath, though. Although the Alan Parsons project is somehow like this perfect band for Patrick Bateman. Now, now that I think about it. Anyway, it's a great song, don't get me wrong. Very cinematic and it's the first time Eric Wolfson actually sang lead. Which is a story of its own in the in the Alan Parsons project canon. But maybe a little beyond uh, the scope of this video. It's being followed by I Don't Wanna Go Home. Uh, now this song is much more my emotional territory. Again sang by Lenny Zakatek, the one and only. It starts very proggy but quickly turns into this very syncopated jazz funk. Some lovely funky guitar by Ian Berenson. And a great way to close the, to close the A side, wanting you immediately to turn the record and keep listening. Now the B side is basically divided into two main parts. First there is the Allen instrumental called this time the Gold Bug, which is certainly a bit of a tongue-in-a-cheek nod uh, to Ennio Morricone, at least I think, while being at the same time of course this great space rock piece. But funny story, it is kind of a lost in history who's playing the rather prominent saxophone here. Many years every, everybody thought that it's Mel Collins, but in later issues it only says a session player in Paris whose name escapes us. So um, this mystery remains unresolved. Now the rest of the album is this giant almost 17 minutes long suite called The Turn of a Friendly Cart. This is uh, certainly another contribution to the is this prog debate that does not interest me at all. The suite consists of five parts, beginning with the highly melodic The Turn of a Friendly Card Part 1, sung by Chris Rainbow. It has this Baroque vibe to it. Some describe it as medieval or Elizabethan. Um, it is followed by Snake Eyes, uh, a really groovy rock song, again continued by Chris Rainbow on vocals with some funky guitar playing by Ian Branson. Very soulful track about the madness of gambling addiction. It is not a topic very familiar to me. I have never gambled in my entire life, I'm far too cheap for that. But I heard Eric Wolfson was, a, was very familiar with this disposition, <laughs> to put it mildly. Uh, the third track here is the Ace of Swords. It is a kind of a short instrumental by Alan Parsons, beautifully arranged for orchestra by Andrew Powell. One of those great Parsonian, Parsonian tracks uh, with this heralding brass section. God, I'm fighting for words here. Which is probably the most idiosyncratic trademark of the Alan Parsons project, this kind of a cinematic pseudo-medieval brass accents. It's something they are very well known for. Yeah, so there's some really strong arrangement, arrangements going on here. Uh, Nothing Left to Lose is a wonderful calm song written and sung by Eric Wolfson. I guess a monetaristic cautionary tale, but I guess it takes one to no one. Uh, by the way, really nice background vocals. There is an accordion in the background also that again in the liner notes uh, refers to an unknown session player. Were they stoned when they did this album? <laughs> the song has a nice recapitulation of the Snake Eyes theme and at the end a really vibrant guitar solo by Ian Berenson of course. The album closes with The Turn of a Friendly Card, part 2, again with the outstanding Chris Rainbow on vocals, with Andrew Powell leading the charge with his orchestra. And then comes a rather bombastic fade-out that certainly was meant to make you run back to the record store and to buy the other project albums available. Some really impressive stuff here. I mean, this entire album goes down like candy. It's 40 minutes that feel more like 20. They were really on top of their game here. Um, it's the first time they did an album cover without hypnosis. Instead, Lol Cream and Kevin Godley designed this. By the way, this is perversely long, this video. And I'm really wondering if anybody would be so crazy to watch it all. Number three, Eye in the Sky. Now, this album came out in 1982 and people immediately threw awards at the band. This record was just incredibly convincing. 
it's rather hard to abscond from this LP. The record opens with this iconic instrumental called Sirius. I guess this one is particularly well known in the United States of A because it's associated with some sport team there. I'm actually glad that my perception of the track is not tainted by stuff like that. Um, and the instrumental, of course, beautifully blends into the title track Eye in the Sky, which is wonderfully sang by Eric Wolfson. And probably his most famous or even most important performance apart from Time, maybe. This song is just stratospheric and Berenson's guitar is great here, but this is all just stuff of legends. Now, um, this track is being followed by two other songs that are just amazing and so adventurous, but often are being completely overlooked uh, like by people that talk about this album or review it. The first being Children of the Moon, sang by David Payton, who delivers an ex excellent performance here. This is great, beautifully pompous production, and you certainly can hear the iconic Andrew Powell arrangements here, combined with a wailing guitar solo by Ian Bernson. And overall, what, a, what an original composition that really sounds different than uh, anything else. Now, the track almost seamlessly blends into Gemini, sang by Chris Rainbow, which is this very unique and otherworldly sounding two-minute song that is just outstanding. And this is such a well-structured album. The way the tracks harmonically lead into each other, the way that Gemini beautifully feels like this introduction to the next song, to the rather epic Silence and I. Now, Powell and Wolfson probably didn't go crazy like that since the B-side of Tales of Mystery and Imagination. The slow piano song evolves into this orgy of orchestral arrangements and odd rhythm patterns. Obviously, this is another great pinnacle of the band. And that's what I mean with seven flawless albums in a row. I mean, this was their sixth album and nothing here sounds tired, fatigued or in any way stale. There's always the possibility that you are kind of too cool for this kind of music. I get it. And that's all right. But I think... This is probably one of the greatest albums to introduce to young people, for example. If you want to introduce teenagers to some adventurous and yet highly sophisticated music before they get dumped down by the shit that comes out of their cell phones. So this is probably the best candy to make the medicine go down. And a great way to end the A-side. Um, now the B-side begins with this complete change of pace uh, with the... Uh, this incredibly dynamic rock song called You're Gonna Get Your Fingers Burned, sang by Lenny Zakatek. Very cliched and yet wonderful. And again, what a singer. If I ever made a list of my top 10 favorite singers, Lenny Zakatek would always be in the top three of that list, if not even in the top two. Next song is Psycho Babble, another highly idiosyncratic pop song, this time sang by Elma Gantry. You know, of Fleetwood, Fleetwood Max fame. <laughs> Amazing track. Completely ridiculous and at the same time totally irresistible. I mean, just listen to the refrain. Over the years and decades, this has actually become one of the most uh, popular tracks by the band. And I can understand why. It's a great example of something they could do so well. Which is combining two things, like here this rather dark, haunting, mo haunting mood of a song about insanity and yet there is this upbeat component which makes it cool and creepy at the same time and great playing by David Payton on bass and ex excellent drumming by Stuart Elliott and of course this song screams for a live performance which was ironic since this was a band that did not play live and of course now it's time for a Alan Parsons instrumental and Mama Gamma might just be the most famous of them. And that's really something. Again, if you imagine this is their sixth album and that track is so signature type and iconic. I mean, people make like four hour loops out of this song and post it on YouTube. This track is rad. That is just the coolest science fiction music you can imagine. And yet those tracks are not as electronic as one would think there's a lot of acoustic elements and moving parts going on here. 
Interestingly, this is not the second last track, as it usually is with uh, Alan Parsons instrumentals, but the third last track. So mild deviation from the formula here. Uh, the second last track is another of my all-time favorites by the Alan Parsons project, Step by Step, sang by none other than Lenny Zakatek. Dare I say it again, amazing and outstanding. This song is like the handbook on how to write a perfect pop song. I hear just no weakness or flaw in this pure perfection. There will be people in the following years and decades who will discover this and uh, their jaws will just drop, puzzled over the question why they haven't heard this before. Wonderful guitar solo again by Ian Bernson and the overall production sound is just gorgeous here. Now the album closes with Old and Wise, beautifully performed uh, by the singer Colin Blundstone. There were, there were times where I felt the song is a little too corny and twee, but now I gave it another listen and yeah, I mean, the sonic quality and the heartfelt performance, it's hard to reject that and to dismiss this song. So another perfect finale ending on a marvelous saxophone solo by Mel Collins. By the way, some uh, imbecile called Ken Tucker of the Philadelphia Inquirer gave this album one star back in the day. Well, fuck you, man. <laughs> so uh, this is a design work by Hypnosis. Probably not their best design, but on the other hand, the album sleeve became quickly quite iconic and is rather recognizable. Also one of the few situations where you can actually see Parsons and Wolfson on the cover. They were usually not so crazy about being photographed for record sleeves or photographed in general. Number two is the 1979's Eve. Now interestingly this is a bit of a controversial decision because I have noted that this album is not too popular even amongst fans. Often it's being described as a bit bland and mediocre, but I wholeheartedly disagree. For many years this has always been my favorite album by the Alan Parsons Project. It certainly still is probably my favorite record cover of all times. I guess some people have an issue with the fact that there is a certain disco vibe to the record here and there. Just check out the entire photograph here. Um, now this is somewhat a loose concept album with the concept being women. I wouldn't read that much to, into it. I'm pretty sure you could take a Beach Boys album or a particular Rolling Stones album and say actually it is a concept album about women <laughs> and it might even stick. The record has certainly been criticized for having somewhat misogynistic lyrics, which I kind of understand where that comes from, but I don't entirely agree. Although there are moments in the lyrics, but then again the lyrics feel mostly observational and not preachy. So let me just say Shame on anyone who thinks evil of it. Again, incredible lineup of the golden era with uh, Eric Wolfson on keyboards, Duncan McKay on keyboards, David Payton, bass and vocals, Stuart Elliott, drums, Ian Berenson, guitar, Andrew Powell, orchestral arrangements, conduction, and a lot of amazing singers. We get to that. Um, so this is a bit of a unique situation because there are actually two female singers here, which never happened with the project. Uh, as you surely noticed, all these singers I keep mentioning were all guys. The album was in large part recorded in Munich, Germany. Particularly the, the orchestral parts by using the orchestra of Eberhard Schöner. This album starts with Lucifer, probably the most famous of Alan Parsons openers, unless uh, that honor belongs to Sirius. Um, actually the theme of Lucifer was used for many many years on German uh, public television. There was a news format called Monitor uh, that used Lucifer uh, during uh, kind of the opening minute of the show. Um, this is a great track and so wonderfully timeless. Um, I mean, you could not date this recording. You could not say if this is recorded in the 70s or 90s or today. 
The next song is called You Lie Down With Dogs and this is a wonderful number sang by Lenny Zakatek and I guess this is an example of these rather angry, angry lyrics that are beautifully performed by Lenny Zakatek but uh, probably could be accused of uh, having uh, misogynistic undertones. His singing here is gigantic and the song has the feel of a kind of a slow disco track with this amazing equalized uh, chorus. Great stuff. Amazing electric piano playing. Probably Duncan McKay or maybe Eric Wilson. And a really killing guitar solo by Ian Bernson. Uh, it's followed by I'd Rather Be a Man. This song is being sung by uh, David Payton, who also plays the bass here. It is, again, one of those tracks that seem to be influenced by um, this entire electronic revolution of those days. You, you certainly kind of feel a touch of Giorgio Moroder here, or maybe Kraftwerk. But the guys here, of course, turn it into something uh, very different, a very intense yet hypnotic song. Um, the next track is You Won't Be There. Now, of course, it is high time for a ballad, for a slow ballad. And this one here is beautifully sung by Dave Townsend. Townsend already sang on iRobot and has this very pleasant kind of velvet voice, perfect for this emotional composition. Again, I'm not much of a guy for ballads, but I can really tolerate Alan Parsons' project ballads. Um, the A-side ends with Winding Me Up, which is an outstanding song. One of the greatest songs by the band. Totally overlooked and underrated. Great orchestra arrangement by Andrew Powell. And amazing vocals by Chris Rainbow. I love this song. Wonderful short solo by Ian Benson. Stuart Elliott's drumming is always immaculate. And Duncan McKay and Eric Wolfson playing some great keyboard parts here. Particularly the entire instrumental section in the middle is just great. Only this band could manage to sound like Emerson, like and Palmer and like Chic at the same time. And then uh, the side two begins uh, with these electronic bubbling sounds. And what forms on the horizon is uh, just another masterpiece beginning with this amazing heralding brass section and then just this wonderful wonderful voice of Lenny Zakatek starting singing Damned If I Do. This track is a killer. I still cannot believe that people rank this album so low because this is one of the best albums I know. Just listen to the guitar solo by Ian Bernson on this track Damned If I Do. It's amazing that tone it's just wow. If you don't get this I don't know what's going on. This whole song is like an avalanche, but what do I know? Next track is called Don't Hold Back and um, of course Claire Torrey, the singer on this track, uh, is better known for her work with uh, Pink Floyd. But it was Alan Parsons who knew her before that and brought her to the recording sessions of Dark Side of the Moon um, to record um, The Great Gig in the Sky. Don't Hold Back is a real upbeat song with a very positive message and certainly contrasting the somewhat little angry lyrics of the A-side. Secret Garden is of course uh, the expected instrumental, typically placed as the, as the second last track. But in this case it is more like a semi-instrumental piece because the wonderful Chris Rainbow is singing here. But without lyrics, adding kind of great texture to this track. Overall, this song has a great vibe and like all these Alan Parsons instrumentals have. Um, and as usual, the last track is a slow burning ballad of sorts with a heavy sense of pathos. It is sang by Leslie Duncan, who, by the way, also sang on The Dark Side of the Moon. This is a truly wonderful love song and most certainly my favorite of all the end songs on a Alan Parsons Project album. Overall, I love this uh, acoustic warmth to this recording. I feel good when I listen to this record. Um, it has just this wonderful, flawless sound that is soft and warm and incredibly well balanced. Now, let's talk about the cover. First of all, this is probably my favorite record cover of all times, not only of the Alan Parsons project. I love this understatement and the visual betrayal behind this photograph. Um, of course, this picture needs to be observed in its entirety. Um, although the font type probably could have been a little better. Um, 
I know that in the late 70s, this power duo of Storm and Poe at Hypnosis employed a third member of the team, Peter Christofferson, aka Sleazy, who actually came from uh, Throbbing Gristles and later became the mastermind behind the band Coil, probably two of the most insane underground bands of all times. Now, Hypnosis never really liked to communicate to the public who did exactly what in all those cover projects, although Storm Thorgerson's style certainly has a certain handwriting to it and is mostly most of the time recognizable. But I always wondered if this one is actually more of a Peter Christofferson job, particularly because of the rather subversive nature of this photograph. Um, I certainly think Peter Christofferson was, for example, behind these famous album covers of the first nameless Peter Gabriel albums, which totally makes sense since those designs really don't have the signature type or feel you expect from Storm Thorgerson. But they relate much more to Christofferson's work, I think. Um, but this is mostly just speculation on my part. And uh, we are heading to our number one, but if you are, if you know the Alan Parsons project, then you know exactly which album I have not shown yet. <coughs> Sorry, my throat is very parched after this endless talking. What's wrong with me? It's, it's like two hours now, isn't it? Completely lunatic, mental. Mm. <sighs> Number one, the year is 1977 and the album is I, Robot. Now this placement is not very unique and not very original and not very surprising. This album constantly ends up on first place. So at least in this one case people will not call me crazy because of my ranking video. This record came out in 1977 and was the band's second album. It also marks the first vocal appearance of Lenny Zakatek. Now this album begins with the typical instrumental but something is different here because this time that is the title track of the album and it is a funky six minutes long epic combining jazz funk and classical music, disco and ambient into this cinematic beast. And technically it's not really an instrumental because in the second minute you suddenly hear the voice of, uh, of the opera singer Hilary Western uh, musing these eerie ghostly melodies before Duncan McKay and Eric Wolfson take over with their highly robotic synthesizer sounds. I mean it's not easy to remember how this felt, how my first experience with this music was because I discovered this music like 35 years ago being a geeky teenager that hated punk music, I was certainly blown away again a few years later when I discovered cannabis, because believe me when I tell you this. But this, I repeat, believe me when I tell you this, but this is the mother of all pot albums. Holy shit. By the way, there are all kind of cool things going on here. For example, Parsons hired John Leach to play the cymbal on here on this opening track, which gives the song this lovely cinematic dimension, uh, kind of like something you would expect from a Lalo Schifrin soundtrack for Mission Impossible. Now the second track marks the first appearance of Lenny Zakatek and it's called I Wouldn't Want To Be Like You. And what a track that is, pure disco rock and this is maybe my favorite Alan Parsons track, who knows, amazing stuff. And what a performance. Now Lenny Zakatek came from a from an outfit called Gonzales, who were kind of pioneering the whole British jazz funk scene in the mid 70s. Now the next track is quite fascinating, particularly from the production side of things. It's called Some Other Time. This is a great song with wonderful sense of drama, but the casual listener probably misses uh, the unique oddity here, because the vocals clearly sound like being sung by one person, with a vocal timbre that is very ambiguous and even somewhat androgynous. But what it really is, is that the verses are being sung by Peter Straker, and the choruses are being sung by Jackie Witheron. So a male and a female singer, but they blend together so well and complement each other 
that hardly anyone takes notice of the fact that this is actually a bit of uh, Alan Parsons trickery using two singers that sound like one. The next track is Breakdown and this is performed by the singer Alan Clark who was uh, the original singer of the Holies. This is a strong vocal performance and of course in all glorious pretentiousness it morphs into this giant orchestral wall with an epic choir taking over. It's, it's madness. It's complete madness. Some great work done by Andrew Powell. Uh, the last track on the A-side is the first real ballad here and it's sang by Dave Townsend and called Don't Let It Show. It is a very soft-spoken uh, track and yet the music graduates in a very energetic and passionate way. So while this is kind of the official ballad here, it completely changes pace in the middle and turns into another horse ride type of song. The B-side begins with another extremely original track, The Voice, sang by Steve Harley. Alan Parsons was producing Cockney Rebel, so that's where the, that connection comes from. Stylistically, it feels like it's somewhat related to Psycho Babble on the Eye in the Sky album. Very similar dark, menacing atmosphere, but at the same time so funky and soulful. For many people this is probably their favorite Alan Parsons project track and I totally understand, it's really a great one. This is followed by Nucleus. Now this track doesn't get much love and even those that review the album and are generally positive don't have that much to say about it and regard it as, type of a, as a type of a filler. But this is just another Alan Parsons instrumental for the B-side and this time just a little different with less emphasis on drums and a disco-ish groove and more emphasis on ambient or proto-ambient at this point in time as you would probably call it today. I've always loved this track. It is such a great chill out expedition. Only three and a half minutes long though but beautifully bold and intentional. The sonic task that Alan Parsons tackles here it's not being just hinted at, it's, it's a fully fledged, abstract, cosmic piece of music. The life on a futuristic space station condensed into 3 minutes 30. And that track beautifully morphs into Day After Day, sang by Jack Harris. This is now the real slow ballad of this album and you can't deny the song's immense beauty. And then, for the next three minutes, Andrew Powell takes completely over and presents Total Eclipse, another atmospheric soundscape, but this time a take in the spirit of modern contemporary orchestral music. And the track is certainly a kind of distant sibling to Lux Eterna by Ligeti, although I once listened to them back to back because it bugged me. And they are in composition rather different, but in it is in this type of vocal work where where the singers sometimes have their own tuning fork in their hand while performing which helps them to orient. So it's very diatonic to say the least. But this Andrew Powell track kind of goes hand in hand with the last composition called Genesis chapter 1 verse 32 which is probably the most Pink Floydian track ever recorded by the project. An epic fade out to a rather flawless album showing a band at the summit of their inspiration and their creative juices. Few words about the cover, obviously a hypnosis job, the tubular gangways are part of the Charles de Gaulle airport in Paris and little manipulated to appear more complex and futuristic. This has become one of the very iconic hypnosis album covers that get shown a lot when people show hypnosis covers in their videos. So just a little nerdy detail, I was talking about Peter Christofferson, the third member of the hypnosis team and uh, he is actually in the photograph here as one of the people inside of the glass tubes. This is Peter Christofferson, still very young here. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, uh, but it's kind of funny because he, he, he looks like a teenager here, but this is the same year. Peter Christofferson released the very first single with uh, Throbbing Gristle, which is hilarious actually. So anyway, this was my long-winded ranking of the Alan Parsons project. Obviously I had a lot to say about the band. What's wrong with me? Can somebody tell me what's wrong with me? 
So, uh, a band well known and respected, hated by some, overlooked by others. Uh, personally, I think that uh, if they had toured like a regular band back in the day, they would today be mentioned in the same sentence uh, with bands like Pink Floyd or Genesis or let's say Toto. But on the other hand, their complete absence from live performances in those active years added a lot to the mystique and made them a band that was almost never associated with faces or types of personalities, but only through their highly dramatic, imaginative and evocative music. But it is telling that there still is not a giant three-hour-long documentary about them, while other bands with uh, much less quality material under their belt have like three or four serious documentaries made about them. So um, let me know how you stand with the project. I know there was a time when I was very young when uh, it was extremely uncool to like this band, but those things mean nothing today. I mean, you can't complain about the Alan Parsons project for piling it on a little bit or to over-egg the pudding a little too much, as the British say. But then you go to cinema and watch some Marvel schlock. You can't have it both ways. I'm sorry. So that was it. You've survived my Alan Parsons project ranking. Not bad. He's one of us. He's one of us. Goodbye.